Okay, hello chess players! Today we're going to be going over the Rey Lopez with e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop to b5, and we're not going to be going over the Berlin or the Marshal in this video. Instead we're going to be going over what people used to have to face 90% of the time when they faced the Rey Lopez, which was a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castles, bishop e7, rook e1, b5, bishop b3, d6, c3, castles, h3, knight a5. This is called the Chigurin variation, and for about a half a century this is what everyone had to play against in almost every game. Anyways, if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please hit that subscribe button, click on your notification icon. So right here, the main move is going to be bishop to c2, because we don't want to lose the bishop pair. Black is going to play pawn to c5, and then we're going to play pawn to d4. So after we play pawn to d4, it's really important to understand the strategic ideas of either decapture c5 or pawn to d5. And another thing to keep in mind is understanding the strategic ideas from here are so important that I would say understanding these strategic ideas is the same as understanding the Rey Lopez itself. It's also the same as just almost understanding chess itself, understanding strategic play, understanding positional play. These concepts are really, really important. That's part of the reason that my Chigurin uh, variation video is going to be broken up into two videos. This video is just going to be on the ideas in the Chigurin variation, the concepts, the strategic play, and the positional play. And then the next video is going to be a deeper dive into a lot of the games and a lot of the theory, and I'm going to go much deeper into a lot of the games that I'm just going to gloss over uh, in this video just to give you what the concepts and what the ideas are. Um, so anyways, d5 and decapture c5 are two major moves in this position that white's threatening to play. And as a matter of fact, white can play these moves almost interchangeably in any position uh, that he chooses. Uh, that's actually what's really incredible about this position. Even after, like, say, the main line, queen c7, there's nothing wrong with just playing d5 right away and just getting your structure. Uh, this was actually played in Kuriana versus Norditsky back in 2020, and white did eventually go on to win. The computer also just says this is slight edge white. Uh, so you can play, you can just play your structure, and there's not a whole lot black can do to stop it. There's apparently nothing wrong with it. Uh, the other concept is taking on c5 and going after that hole on d5. So a great example of that was uh, Bobby Fischer versus Paul Carey's. Well, part, well, where Paul Carey's played knight to d7, and Fischer replied with the immediate decapture c5. Of course, noting that knight c5 is not possible because of b4, so you're going to have to play d capture c5, and then Fischer's idea was pretty straightforward. He wanted to play knight d2, and he wanted to go after that hole on the d5 square. And somehow, after the next couple of moves, after queen to c7, knight f1, knight to b6, knight to e3, rook to d8, queen e2, bishop e6, when Fischer finally played knight d5, according to the engine, white's position is completely decisive. So just that simple idea of taking on c5 and then maneuvering to d5 by itself was basically enough to win a whole game of chess. Now, of course, again, like I said, I'm going to do a deeper dive into some of these games. Of course, you know, carries could have played differently with the black pieces. Of course, knight d7 by itself is by no means obligatory. Um, so that's another uh, concept that, uh, that white has, is he can go after the d5 square as a weakness. So one of the things that you have to understand when you're looking at this push, when you're looking at this pawn uh, d4 to d5, so like if you want to meet queen c7 with pawn to d5 right away, one of the things that you have to understand is something called the Rubenstein maneuver. And this is a maneuver that dates back to the turn of the century, not this century, but the last century, the turn of the night, the turn, the turn of the 20th century, so 1907. So so not the turn of this very last century. Um, so 1907. Uh, was a game uh, between Bernstein and Rubenstein, and that game continued with queen c7, knight on b to d2, which is the main line theory here, is knight on b to d2. d5 is playable, knight on b to d2 is the main line, and then that game continued knight c6, and then white played the move d5. This was Bernstein versus Rubenstein played back in 1907. We had d5 and then knight d8. Now here I've drawn a lot of arrows, and they're really, really important. Okay, so Black's idea behind knight d8 was not to bring his knight to c5, which anybody looking at this position for the first time might think that that's the concept, that we want to play c4, knight b7, followed by knight c5. It looks really logical, it looks really smart, it looks like a great place to put that knight. Wasn't Rubenstein's idea at all. Rubenstein's idea was actually to bring this knight to the f7 square, because White's primary strategy when he plays d4 to d5 is to start getting an attack on the king side. And again, I'll, like I said, understanding the strategic play in the Rey Lopez is just similar to understanding the strategic play in chess in general. 
white has more space and therefore white can attack on basically either side of the board that he wants and it's more desirable to go after the black king because if we attack over there and we win that's going to be checkmate okay so white is going to go after this kingside attack black needs to come up with some way to counter it now bernstein back in 1907 he came up with a very clever way to counter it uh, the game continued with knight f1 white's going after this kingside attack and then we have knight to e8 now this is bernstein's clever idea he wants to play one pawn to f6 one pawn to g6 one pawn to f6 bring his knight to f7 bring his knight to g7 and that's going to prevent white from breaking through on the king side and he follows through with that plan white does some stuff over on the queen side which he should and i'll get to that in a minute and then rubenstein says well i want the queen side to be relatively stable so he plays rook b8 a takes b5 a takes b5 and then we have g4 going after that king side in the normal way by the way with g4 knight g3 threatening knight f5 etc g6 knight g3 knight g7 just guarding that f5 square king h1 f6 rook g1 knight f7 and now both knights are in place the move that white usually plays here kind of the stock sacrifice knight f5 is covered multiple times and uh therefore white who was bernstein couldn't figure out how to make progress here now what's interesting is the engine still says this is advantage white and probably white should have kept playing and bernstein did for a little while he played bishop e3 bishop d7 queen e2 rook a8 knight d2 king h8 b3 queen b7 and then bishop d3 uh, but then after rook a6 rook gb1 rook f8 he agreed to a draw because he's he couldn't figure out how to make progress with black basically dominating the only open file on the board but at least according to the engine white should have kept trying he could have played rook a6 queen a6 and for example knight df1 and just maybe tried to press on the king side or just tried to do something a little different um but this kind of highlights one of the problems that white can run into when he's playing this pawn thrust with pawn on d4 to d5 is that black can sort of plant his pieces on these defensive squares and it might be difficult for white to break through on the king side so that leads us to our next important concept about countering the rubenstein maneuver is we need to leave our options open to play on both sides of the board and like i said before that's why mastering the royal lopez is akin to mastering all of chess understanding how to win with the Royal Lopez from this type of position where you've pushed your pawn is also understanding how to operate with whole board play. You're not just playing on the king side, you're not just playing in the middle, you're playing on both wings. And you need to leave your options open on both wings. Because if black manages to maneuver his knights to f7 and g7 and gets all of his pieces over the king side, you need to be prepared to break through on the queen side. Otherwise you're just getting shut down and you're not going to make progress because as we saw with Bernstein versus Rubenstein, Bernstein couldn't figure out how to make progress. So you should be playing a4 here. Just go ahead and do something on the queen side. Just make him think about it. Queen b7, and then we have knight f1, and then we have knight e8 trying to set up the same maneuver. We're trying to set up the Rubenstein maneuver. Uh, the game that I'm following here is actually Svidler versus Piquet uh, that was played in Tilburg back in 1998. And that game continued with knight to h2, f6, uh, b3 and note how white is kind of keeping his options open on the queen side while he's generating attacking potential on the king side and then after knight f7 white decides to strike in the middle with pawn to f4 so we have not just a king side attack not just a queen side attack but also a central thrust going on with pawn to f4 so this big whole board play and at least according to the engine white has some sort of advantage here we have f4 e takes f4 bishop f4 knight comes to e5 knight to e3 g6 knight on e to g4 bishop g4 knight g4 knight g4 and then hg4 which was actually correct taking back with the h pawn and now after knight to c7 we have rook f1 rook f7 and then according to the engine after queen f3 white has a decisive advantage and he's still effectively playing on both sides of the board he's always threatening to open this queen side so the queen side can't be easily abandoned and he's also creating threats in the middle creating threats on the king side as well and black was never able to fully set up his fortress with knight f7 to g7 because it never made sense white went after the center of the board how would having your knights set up to prevent g knight to f5 be helpful in that situation when he's clearly attacking the middle
So attacking all three wings in these situations where Black tries to set up that Rubenstein maneuver, this is basically the way to go. And this is a big part of understanding uh, not just the Ray Lopez, but just understanding how to play positions where you have a little bit of extra space in general. This comes with a lot in d pawn openings as well. Uh, so we have pawn to b4, we have bishop to d2, pawn to a5, c captures b4, c captures b4, rook a c1, we have rook a to f8, bishop to d3, and now it's very clear that white has an advantage, uh, black has weaknesses, as you can see all the highlighted squares are weak, e6, c6, c6 is a gaping weakness, we're going to plant a piece there, h6 is even weak, and of course white has the bishop pair and more space. So here we have knight a6, white is not going to allow that knight to blockade with knight to c5, so bishop takes a6, uh, queen takes a6, rook c6, and now white's position is easily winning. And uh, the next whole bunch of moves, there's a lot of maneuvering that's a little redundant. Uh, queen a7, bishop e3 is fine. And um, in a few moves here, you're going to see a lot of back and forth play from white, where he goes back and forth, basically just gaining time on the clock. But also he knows that he's at no risk of having a worse position with black essentially being in this trapped location. This bishop being uh, even worse than a big pawn. It's not even attached to the pawn chain. It's behind the pawns. It's just a terrible piece. It's a target. Uh, he knew that eventually he'd be able to maneuver to win. So we have bishop to d8, rook to c6, and then we have rook on 1 to c4, finally making some progress. But then eventually white decides to exchange some stuff to make progress, brings his queen to a more powerful square, brings his rook to a more powerful square, and then breaks through with the queen h6 maneuver, which is completely winning. Queen takes h6, queen takes g4, and then we have this move rook to c7. And the move rook to c7 basically wins because after rook c7, queen e4 is not going to be any help because we have bishop takes f6, which is winning due to the fact that we can meet bishop takes f6 with queen h7 and queen f7 mate. And there is no perpetual because queen e1 check can't come back to h4 with check because the bishop takes it, can't come back to e5 with check because the bishop takes it. So after this, uh, white would have just been completely winning and would have had a huge advantage there. So basically that covers the basics of understanding how the Royal Lopez works. Uh, you have to understand what your basic concepts are at the beginning of this opening, where you have the option to push your pawn with d5. You have to understand about the Rubenstein setup. You have to understand that in order to face the Rubenstein setup, you have to be prepared to play on the whole board, not just the king side, but also the center, also the queen side. And you have to understand that there are situations where maybe you want to take and maybe you want to go after that weakness on the d5 square. And you have to understand how to play in the middle of the board when they do decide to take everything and you have a little bit more space and you have an advantage in the middle of the board in terms of space, uh, much like we saw in that Gotakomsky game. Anyways, uh, this is my first video of two in the Chigger and Defense in the Roy Lopez. Uh, my next video is going to take a much deeper dive into some of the games that I only glossed over in this video. We're going to take a much closer look at that Fisher versus Carries game, and we're going to take a much closer look at uh, positions where they exchange in the center one time and we have to play knight b3. And of course, we're going to take a much closer look at some of the positions where we play an even earlier d5 and some of the strategic concepts and some full games uh, in those videos where white manages to outplay black in some of those positions without black being able to set up that Rubenstein structure, or even after black has set up the Rubenstein structure, being able to outplay him on the queen side. Anyways, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you found uh, these ideas useful. I hope you can use some of these ideas in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.